This film is brought to you by New York Life and its 9,500 agents and representatives who offer you quality financial products and services to help you get the most out of life. The Pittsburgh Steelers all share a sense of disappointment over the results of their 1986 season. We felt that uh, we could come in and, and, and really take charge and, uh, you know, number one on the list to win a division, and we felt that we could do that. And Malone with a short drop, looks out to the right and fires to lips on a slant, he drops it at the 43-yard line. I think guys, myself uh, included, were a little bit ashamed, uh, a little bit taken back by the kind of football we played early on in the year. And Mark is rolling right, throws one to the 18, it's picked off and carried down the sideline, and that is Dave Brown in the end zone for the touchdown. Malone. Three years ago, we went to the AFC Championship game. We won the, uh, the close games, the big plays, and that's something we haven't been able to do offensively or defensively, has come up with a big play the last couple of years. The end zone, they're rushing him. Oh, oh, he's in trouble. They blocked the kick, and they're going to recover it in the end zone, and it's a touchdown. The kick is blocked and the ball is recovered in the end zone by Deron Cherry. We were losing games, close games, just by mental errors. And uh, I don't think that uh, any Steeler team that I've been associated with has ever made that many mental er errors in crucial situations in ball games that cost us ball games. They have to realize what it takes to win, and there's no easy road to it. The guys that were here in the 70s could tell you that. By season's end, the guys from the 1980s were showing their true colors. Early season injuries healed, and new talent arrived to help fuel a spirited second half surge. They played Pittsburgh Steeler football and serve notice to the powers that be that it won't be long until the Steelers are right there with them. More than one pro football writer called the 1986 season Chuck Knoll's finest head coaching job. A season with dismal beginnings became a season the Steelers could build on. For the Pittsburgh Steelers, the 1986 season had painful beginnings. Crucial time loss injuries to Pro Bowl center Mike Webster and a host of others crippled Pittsburgh's offensive effectiveness. Even the fabled Three Rivers Jinx lost its magic as the Cleveland Browns came to town and won for the first time since the stadium opened back in 1970. The following Monday in Cincinnati, Chuck Knoll started rookie quarterback Bubby Brister and the youngsters' promising skills breathed life into the Steeler attack. In the end, however, the Steelers fell victim to their own mental lapses. All right, here's the snap. Now they're faking the punt and running with it. And here comes Hayes up over the 40, the 45, the 50, down the sideline, cuts back. He's to the Pittsburgh 35, the 30, the 20, the 10, and he's going all the way for a touchdown. 
Fortunately, there was a silver lining in Pittsburgh's early season storm clouds. A well-traveled young running back named Ernest Jackson. Ernie's an interesting guy. You know, here's a guy that's, that's bounced around and gained 1,000 yards wherever he's been. Uh, for, for some reason, he ends up in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful for that. He has a style very, very similar to that of Frank Pollard. Uh, if you watch him run, they run very, very similarly. It's a style that utilized the crushing blocks of top draft choice John Reenstra. A straight ahead, blue collar style that earned Jackson instant respect among Steeler fans. An effective style that produced 910 rushing yards in just 13 games and earned Jackson a trip to the Pro Bowl. Ray Penny, Craig Wolfley, Mike Webster, Terry Long, and Tunch Yokin share the credit, for this is still one of pro football's best offensive lines, allowing the second fewest quarterback sacks in the league. Only one all season by right tackle Tunch Yokin. It could also spring Walter Abercrombie. Abercrombie put together his best season in the pros. The fifth year running back rushed for a career high 877 yards. In a year of injuries, he led the Steelers in pass receptions. And in overtime in Houston, his touchdown gave the Steelers their first win of the season. And Malone is under center. And Malone to Abercrombie driving off the right side into the end zone. Touchdown, the Steelers win the football game. Driving off right tackle, Abercrombie takes it into the end zone. And in overtime, they win the football game. And is he saying it off that right side? It was Ernest Jackson, the new Steeler, who gave him the block, you bet you. Unfortunately for the Steelers, their week four win in the Astrodome was their only win through the season's first seven weeks. Lesser teams might have tossed in the towel and coasted out the year, but Chuck Knoll's team still had some scores to settle, beginning with the Cincinnati Bengals. On the final weekend of October, just one week after their loss to the Patriots, one of their worst ever in Three Rivers Stadium, Pittsburgh's two-back attack crushed the Cincinnati Bengals and salvaged the 1986 season. And along the way, they discovered the Steeler faithful were still behind them. Wing in motion to the right. And the pitch carried by Jackson. He goes in standing up. Nobody touched him. He went out to the right, around the corner, and into the end zone. Ernest Jackson scores the touchdown to cap the drive. And the Steelers move their lead out to 29. In 1986, Gary Anderson became the NFL's all-time leader in field goal accuracy making each of his kicks a collector's item. Anderson's kickoffs also had a following, foremost among whom was linebacker Anthony Henton, Pittsburgh's Rookie of the Year as selected by the Pittsburgh chapter of the Pro Football Writers Association. On the return side, free agent Loop Sanchez became only the second stealer in history to lead the conference in kickoff returns. Safety Rick Woods finished sixth in the conference in punt returns, one of which set up the season's first win. 
And he sends a wobbly kick up the woods. Grab it, Rake, at the 45, over the 50, to the Houston 45, down to the 40, the 35, still running. He needs a block. Here he goes to the 20, and the kicker pushes him out of bounds at the 15. Free agent Chris Sheffield started six games in place of the injured Dwayne Woodruff. Luke Sanchez, Harvey Clayton, and John Swain handled the rest of the cornerbacking chores. Five members of the Pittsburgh secondary recorded three interceptions, including free safety Eric Williams. But nobody back there used his head more than Donnie Shell. On December 7th, the four-time Super Bowl vet made NFL history. Ferguson right down the middle, and it is tipped, and then intercepted. Here we come, Donnie Shell with the ball. And he's down to the 30th of the 28-yard line. Tipped by Luke Sanchez into the hands of Shell, and for Shell... It's his 50th, and he now passes Ken Houston, the Hall of Famer. He's the first strong safety in history to intercept 50 passes. Donnie Shell, still alive and kicking. On the defensive front, 10-year veteran Gary Dunn played with renewed consistency. The rest of Pittsburgh's defensive linemen were younger men at different stages of their development. Fifth-year pro Edmund Nelson was a rock at several different defensive line positions. Two former first-round draft picks contributed to a successful pass rush. Number 92, Keith Gary. And number 99, Daryl Sims. Last year's second-round pick, Gerald Williams, also made an impression. Then there was Keith Willis. Number 93 was Pittsburgh's best pass rusher. His constant pressure was a factor in all of Pittsburgh's wins, and his 12 quarterback sacks, hard-earned sacks, were the third highest single-season total in team history. Keith Willis may soon become the first Steeler defensive lineman since Joe Green to play in the Pro Bowl. But for the 17th straight season, a Steeler linebacker did make all pro. That man was Mike Merriweather. Merriweather can do it all on the outside. Stuff the run. Cover the pass. Pressure the passer. Bury pass catchers. Inside linebackers Robin Cole and David Little stood tall against the run. The other top gun in this high-flying unit was the man at the other outside linebacking position. Number 53, Brian Hinkle. Hinkle led the team in tackles and was voted Pittsburgh's most valuable player by his teammates. In Pittsburgh's pivotal October rematch with Cincinnati, it wasn't just the ground game that was ready for the Bengals. Pro football's third highest scoring team brought its multiple offense to Three Rivers. It didn't put a dent in the inspired Steeler defense. Cincinnati Bengals failed to score a touchdown.
Just as the Steeler faithful had rallied behind Pittsburgh's offense, so did they stand and shout for the Steeler defense. Pittsburgh's second season had begun. Pittsburgh's hopes for 1987 hinge on the continued improvement of quarterback Mark Malone. Malone is well aware of the challenge facing him, for by his own admission, his performance was not up to par in the early weeks of 1986. It's a combination of a couple things. First of all, early on in the season, I didn't play well, and I think that uh, there were a couple reasons for that. Uh, I think because of the injuries, I tried to overcompensate and do some things that maybe I wasn't capable or comfortable doing. Malone will do anything to help his team win. And at 6'4", 220, he's one of the team's most gifted athletes. In Malone's defense, the hard knocks sustained by Louis Lips denied Malone full use of his most dangerous offensive weapon. But like the rest of the Steelers, Mark Malone sidestepped disaster with a big performance in the crucial rematch against Cincinnati. Tentative and uncertain before this game, from week eight on, Malone and the Steeler offense played winning football. Ouija Thompson scored three times in Pittsburgh's 27-3 win over the Packers. They get the play away, and here's Malone laying it down in the end zone. And another catch by Ouija Thompson for a touchdown, and that was a sensational catch. Rich Ehrenberg was a reliable receiver out of the backfield, scoring a touchdown in Pittsburgh's second win over Houston. Wide receiver Calvin Sweeney performed well when injuries thrust him into a starting role in seven games. Mark Malone also discovered that tight end Preston Gothard could do more than block. The venerable John Stallworth lost nearly half the season to injury, and his sure hands and precise patterns were sorely missed. But by season's end, number 82 was back in form, climbing to 18th on the all-time pass-catching chart, just four receptions shy of 500. Finally, there's Pittsburgh's golden boy, wide receiver Lewis Lips, the impact player of the Steelers' ball control attack. I think with our style of football, offensively, where we want to run the football, control the football, and then throw the football off the play action and so forth. In the past, we've been able to do that and create big plays out of that situation. And Louie's the kind of person that we need to have in there to have the big play happen. Lips put the fight back in Pittsburgh's offense. When he catches the football, he's capable of breaking tackles and turning uh, average pass receptions into big touchdowns for you. The thing that, that's been encouraging to me is we've been out of the race, and the team has continued to work very hard. They've continued to go out and play with enthusiasm when we've won some ball games. Uh, and I think that shows a little bit of character. The thing that is encouraging to me as a player is that the guys are out there killing themselves and playing as hard as they possibly can. You're going to eliminate the mistakes, and you're going to start to develop some continuity with each other, and you're going to win those close football games. During the final weeks of the 1986 season, Pittsburgh played a trio of playoff-bound teams on the road. Malone has star with the motion, pitches it out to Abercrombie, and he sweeps over the right side, cuts back to 30, the 20, the 15, the 10, the 5, driving for the end zone. Did he make it? Now they both, what are they saying? In Cleveland, 
Gary Anderson's last second 40-yard field goal tied the score, but the Steelers lost in overtime. At the field goal, at the goal to the right, and the snap, Newsom has the ball, rolls out, throws a pass downfield to Gothard, and he takes it for an apparent touchdown. Preston Gothard cut it in the end zone. Something in Chicago, the Steelers took the defending world champions into overtime before losing a 13-10 heartbreaker. The New York Jets had the misfortune of being next. have the nucleus of a great football team. It was a disappointing season this year, but I think we've all learned a lot from it, and uh, I think we're going to build on it. Now Brian lays it down, and it is picked off. This is Sanchez down over the 50. Sanchez to the 45, takes off. Sanchez racing. O'Brien goes after him. Can't get him. Luke Sanchez. And I want to be a better football player, so I'm looking forward to a much better year, and I think a much more consistent year uh, in 1987. It's a 40-yard touchdown pass. I think the true Steelers fan realizes or realized that this was a rebuilding year for us, and uh, I think we realize now what it takes to win football games, and we're going to be a good football team next year. The 1986 Pittsburgh Steelers came on strong, and their tale of two seasons was filled with promise. If I was to tell the fans anything, uh, I would just tell them, give us a chance. This film was brought to you by New York Life and its 9,500 agents and representatives who offer you quality financial products and services to help you get the most out of life.